Uh, my name is Jay. I'm an engineer at Indeed.com. I work on our service architecture team, and today I'm here to talk to you about how we're starting to adopt gRPC services uh, and facilitate kind of newer capabilities inside of our organization. Uh, I've been with Indeed for four and a half years. If you want to reach out to me, you can contact me via email, uh, Twitter, GitHub, kind of you name it. By and large, I'm here to talk to you today about, or tell you a story about migration. Um, in 2009, Indeed developed Boxcar, its proprietary distributed services framework. In 2012, we announced the performance improvements it offered to our infrastructure. And then in 2013, we did a tech talk on the protocol and some of the finer components. Um, for the purpose of today's talk, you don't actually need to know all that much about Boxcar. Uh, if you're interested in the finer details, you can go and check out our tech talk on YouTube. Um, and with that being said, you can kind of keep a few little details in mind. First, Boxcar was written on top of protocol buffers. It balances connections between servers and not requests. There's one ongoing request per connection. And the load balancing scheme requires a fixed number of connections to be pre-established um, in order for things to work. Um, the scheme lies somewhere between round robin and the proxy-based model, um, but by and large, it tends to manifest itself as naive round robin. Today, Boxcar still plays a very, fairly large, important role in our architecture. We have over 160 services running in, in production. Uh, these services are very high performance, Client perceived latency is very low, and it runs out of box without any additional uh, configuration. HTTP and REST have started to play more and more of a crucial role in our infrastructure, and so we see about 20 or so services in production today. These systems tend to have a very high latency involved when performing communication with them, and configuring these services and getting them running actually takes a fair amount of work from our operations team, especially if you require TLS in your means of communication. In its original implementation, Boxcar was implemented as a library that your team would pull into your project. This pattern is often referred to as a thick client, and each web app embeds a small load balancer inside of itself. There's one load balancer per service, so if you have an account management service, it gets its own dedicated load balancer. If you have a candidate data service, it gets its own load balancer as well. The problem with this solution is that as Indeed has started to grow over the last several years, uh, we needed to start adopting new languages to kind of stay relevant. Uh, with Boxcar only having a few native library implementations, uh, adding support for languages like Python and PHP became extremely difficult and in some cases impossible. Also, the service framework required a lot of tribal knowledge to get started and was very slow to iterate on. So as we wanted to add newer features, uh, we needed to wait several quarters for those features to roll out to all of our production systems. Additionally, it was hard to test locally. Teams would have to spin up local proxies, uh, make manual, manually configured requests, um, things that just were very slow to get going. As with any kind of iterative solution, we look back, at, we look back over our original implementation and see what, to see what improvements we could make. One thing we could do is decouple the Boxcar implementation with our web application. This would allow us to write web apps in any language that we wanted to, and the load balancing would be encapsulated by the sidecar process. And so that's what we started to consider. We went and developed a sidecar. This is a very popular pattern starting to emerge. Um, canonically, uh, Indeed kind of refers to these as co-processes, which are a little odd, um, but even companies like Microsoft Fox and Netflix have all talked about co-processes running in their infrastructure as well. As a sidecar, we're able to solve a lot of that development toil that we encountered in the library implementation. While Indeed needs to continue to maintain backwards and forwards compatibility on the wire protocol, we're now able to control the release cycles a little bit better by going and actually manually deploying these sidecar processes. Uh, this, makes sure, this makes it so we can have uh, the sidecar pick up required features by a certain date um, and push that architecture a little bit further. 
uh, because, this, because our engineers are historically bad at naming things, we obviously named this coprocess a sidecar. Uh, in its original implementation, it would take HTTP 1.1 requests, translate it into a boxcar request, and then perform the boxcar request on its behalf. By introducing sidecar, we were able to solve some of these problems. Most languages have native HTTP clients, which made it really easy to communicate with. Clients no, longer had to work, no, clients no longer had to worry about the specific implementation details of load balancing, and languages like Python and PHP could easily get started with this system. Sorry. The travel knowledge requirement was reduced quite a bit. Uh, by encapsulating load balancing logic inside of the sidecar, clients no longer needed to worry themselves with this and only needed to know how to construct a request to that process. Uh, and because we went through and wrote so many tools to test Boxcar, uh, we didn't really quite solve that problem using this solution. And that's why the development toil is left unmarked. Um, additionally, one of the other things that kind of got introduced as we introduced the sidecar process was some more development toil. A uh, custom library in Python was written that encapsulated the logic for speaking with sidecar. Uh, this took a protocol buffer file and co-generated a small footprint uh, for the consuming application. This was yet another thing that we needed to maintain and something that we needed to iterate on as time went on. And so acknowledging that Indeed has been growing and starting to uh, adopt new languages and new technologies, we really wanted to consider our reconsider our service architecture. Over the summer, a few of my friends and I went and went through an innovation rotation where we started to reimagine some of these components. An innovation rotation is just a small three-month block where we're able to work on something that we find valuable to the company and then present our findings at the end of that three-month block. In our innovation rotation, we set out to do three things. One was improve RESTful services at Indeed, make it so we didn't have as much configuration, make it so that way we could kind of iterate forward. Uh, the second thing we wanted to do was support gRPC and HTTP2 as means of communication. Um, and the last thing we wanted to do was evaluate service mesh opportunities. At the end of the summer, we had tested and monitored the overhead of an HTTP2 connection, and now all of our Java processes support HTTP2 as means of communication out of box. The service mesh, we wanted to establish criteria that we wanted inside of the solution, evaluated the various options on the market, and ultimately wound up selecting one in the end. And so in our considered V2 architecture, we wanted something that would look a little bit more like this. Obviously, we need to continue to maintain boxcar and sidecar as their legacy services, um, but ideally moving over more towards having a proper service mesh, gRPC, and RESTful-based services in the end. Now, as we started to work on this V2, one question I started to ask myself was, you know, how might we migrate our existing infrastructure to it? And Sidecar posed a very interesting position in this process. But before we could leverage Sidecar, we needed to make a few improvements. One, we needed to improve performance. Uh, having multiple network connections over to a single Sidecar process was very crafty. Um, and using a text-based protocol was a little non-optimal for the types of requests we were performing. We wanted to remove the toil for adding new languages, so no more of these custom libraries that people would have to go and write or maintain, no more code generation, uh, none of that. And lastly, we wanted to keep in mind that we wanted to treat this process as an intermediary as we migrated. So going back and reevaluating our original solution, a quick optimization comes out of box of using HTTP2. By using this, we now have all of our requests going over a single TCP connection, uh, they're multiplex, so we don't have to worry about spawning up additional ones as needed. Uh, and this makes much more efficient use of our network space. The other thing it does is it facilitates the use of a binary protocol rather than the text-based one, so we didn't have to go through and uh, base64 encode all of our requests that we made as we communicated with Sidecar. <coughs> From there, we sought to solve the client language problem. After understanding how Sidecar took requests and relayed them to Boxcar, uh, it was really easy to go in and add gRPC support. 
uh, our sidecar process is written in Go, and so Go's implementation of gRPC has this nice little feature of an unknown service handler. For those of you that don't know, the unknown service handler is invoked whenever a service is not discovered on the target server. From there, we can take the request and parse out the components, such as the service that we're calling, as well as the method that we're invoking, and then relay that according, accordingly to the various boxcar services that we're calling. With that solution, we, were no longer, we no longer needed to maintain our custom sidecar implemented, sidecar Python library. But as I started to go and get more and more client languages supported in, at Indeed, I found adding all the dependencies to my local box to be a little crufty. Um, each language required their own set of dependencies to be able to compile and generate source code. Uh, and Indeed supports five out of box. Java, Go, Python, PHP, and Node. So I wanted to look to simplify this process a little bit and wrote a, a quick open source library that lets us go and generate code inside of a Docker image. When invoking from command line, you can specify a whole bunch of different arguments, pr primarily the language, the source proto directory, and the target directory you're generating out into. And, oh, really? I don't trust demos, so we did a video. Uh, the gRPC gen docker library has a demo branch. On um, that demo branch, is it actually playing? Indeed, alpha forward slash gRPC gen hyphen docker. All right, it says it's playing. I don't believe it. Lame. All right, network buffering is not cooperating. So we'll go back. So the nice thing is that this little script encapsulates the logic of pulling down the various Docker images for you, performing all of the code generation in the background, and then copying the built artifacts out of the Docker image. This is not pleasant because it opened a new tab. Does uh, this process run in the CI? Yep. We do all of our code generation inside of a managed build system, so it's able to encapsulate some of those dependencies, but when you want to add new support, you don't want to go out to every build server, add every dependency, uh, and go from there. Um, but yeah, the, it goes and actually stands up the Docker images, can do it in parallel, pull all of the information out, and then have all of your client libraries ready for you and available. I'm going to skip that video. Um, like I said, as we wanted to evolve and iterate on Sidecar, we wanted to keep in mind that we wanted to move to a service mesh and later on. Um, some of the key things to remember about a service mesh is that it helps encapsulate a lot of business logic that you don't want to encumber your applications with. Things like circuit breaking uh, is really easy to get configured in applications, but as you go and start to support multiple libraries, you find every circuit breaking library has their own way to configure, different feature support, so on and so forth. So having kind of one canonical implementation to reference would be great, um, and service meshes give you that ability. Uh, in our considered v2, we wanted to have our system look something like this. Web apps make HTTP2 requests to on boxes, uh, Linkerd instances, and then those Linkerd instances communicate with off-box Linkerd instances, ultimately targeting that service. In the traditional boxcar setup, our web apps connect directly to the web apps, and so there's a little bit of teasing apart here that we have to do. By delegating all of our load balancing logic into our sidecar process, uh, we now have sm smaller and dumber clients. And our pattern starts to look a little bit more like that service mesh that we had targeted originally. From here, we can A-B test both the service mesh and our existing solution. Make sure performance is on par, make sure requests are being relayed completely. Um, certain services that are read only, we can actually do dark traffic tests where we fork a request and just throw out its response. 
Ultimately, we'd want to kill off our old sidecar and boxcar-based implementations and settle on the Linkerd and service mesh-based implementation. Again, revisiting some of those core concepts and benefits of using a service mesh. All of those uh, business logic and, and key implementation details, such as circuit breaking, load balancing, and service discovery, are all encapsulated in one. You don't have to write that flavor library for every service or every client language that you want to support. Your request path, request path is consistent. So whether you're writing an HTTP or RESTful-based service, you have knowledge of how the request was performed. You don't have to know the finer working details of every service implementation out there uh, to go and debug it. You can hop right in and understand how everything's flowing. Lastly, this gives you the ability to centralize visibility into these request flows. Things like open tracing and Zipkin play very nicely with this implementation, and you can see where requests fail along the way. By and large, this is a very easy integration, especially for developers to understand. All of your communication is pointed at local host, and when you're writing clients, you don't have to think too hard about how things happen. So where are we today? Indeed currently has gRPC support in Sidecar uh, and has three client libraries generating for that, one for Go, Python, and Node.js. We have a bridge layer that lets us continue to use boxcar generated code, but perform all of our communication over gRPC. This will make it easy for our boxcar services to migrate over to using this infrastructure later on. They can continue to use thick client options, or they can even delegate all of that information to the uh, service mesh layer. Some of the things that are still in progress is the full adoption of a service mesh. We're considering solutions like MySQL, Redis, uh, MongoDB as immediate adopters. Um, we have data teams and uh, different development teams starting to stand up their own proxies for communicating with various, uh, some of these various systems. Um, and some of the things that we got a little blocked on was how to handle gRPC in Java. Um, naturally, when you run your own Hadoop cluster internally, uh, the question of how do you deal with the Proto3 um, library version comes into place. Uh, there's a few solutions out there. The gRPC IO forums call out to shading that library and handling it that way. Um, I did a little bit of a compatibility analysis between the Proto3 and Proto2 serialization and found that they were roughly compatible with one another and there weren't too many sharp edges. Um, but the, the kind of way that we've been looking at things lately has been using things like OSGI and uh, shading at build time rather than um, doing it during the source code compilation. So let's kind of recap over the slew of features that we had run through, um, or the slew of things that we had talked about. Uh, we talked about some of the inefficiencies inside of the boxcar framework as Indeed has started to grow and adopt new languages. Uh, additionally, as I called out, boxcar requires a fixed number of connections, so as you hire on 400 new engineers, uh, you have 1,600 new connections to deal with. We talked a little bit about evolving sidecar to support gRPC and remove some of that toil of needing to communicate with existing boxcar services in production while quickly adding support for new languages that we wanted to offer. We talked about how we leverage sidecar, how we can leverage sidecar as means of migrating towards a service mesh. And lastly, we talked about kind of the state of the world where Indeed is using gRPC today. Thank you. Questions? Um, so what, uh, why was Proto 3 not compatible to the Java client, not? Uh... It's not that it wasn't compatible. Um, we found serialization, so long as you're still generating code using the Proto 2 compiler, things tended to play well with one another. Um, as long as you didn't wind up with that proto generated three. There's some more like extensive based testing that I wanted to do, but I haven't gotten around to doing it yet. But we've seen pretty good success with these um, Python and Node clients that are using proto generated, our proto three generated code um, and interrupting with our existing boxcar services that are using proto two. Now, when you go into the Hadoop landscape, you're kind of forced into the bootloader that they have there where there's proto two at the bootloader layer versus 
Proto 3 at your application level layer. Uh, and so we wanted to make sure that uh, when invoking certain aspects of gRPC, uh, we preserve the Proto 3 invocation path. And so uh, one of our teams have started using OSGI in that case, where anytime a client uh, invokes code within your service package layer, um, we make sure we invoke gRPC and Proto 3 properly. Um, and then shading at runtime is also another possible, or not at runtime, at build time is another possibility. So, cool. Yes? Were you able to uh, identify early metrics around network latency? When we were doing, when we were doing HTTP2 based testing, there was very little overhead, especially for on box HTTP2 calls. Um, sub millisecond effectively. I had to go down to the nanosecond layer to get any kind of rough timing around that. Um, obviously with the initial connection establishment, there's a lot more overhead, but ideally your application isn't issuing requests in the critical path on that initial connection establishment. Um, we have background dependencies that are constantly pinging these services and keeping these channels open for us. Um, that way we can ensure that when a request comes in, uh, we can have that pre-established connection for us. Any other questions? What drove the need for having to support multiple languages? Correct? So our labs team uh, is by and large an incubator. They're making new projects on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, they use Python by and large. And the reason for that is speed of delivery. Uh, they're able to prototype an idea and get it out in a matter of time, uh, or in a matter of uh, much smaller time than if they were to use Java. Now, they need to get access to existing production data, so rather than going and rolling their own system, they wanted to talk to Boxcar. And so going and using something like gRPC to communicate with those existing services proved to be promising because gRPC offers code generation across a larger variety of languages. Uh, we don't need to worry too much about adding our own support for it and then trying to build that into our timing. Um, a lot of this would just come kind of naturally and we can offer it quickly. I think I got the Node.js implementation working in a day or so. So not really an overhead there. I saw one more, yes. We did not have to migrate any RESTful implementations over to using protobufs. Um, we have a few HTTP APIs that are using protocol buffers as their means of transport, but they also support things like JSON and XML. Um, the Spring framework, if you're using Java, has an uh, actual message converter built into it for converting requests based on either protobuf, JSON, or XML, and so you can use protobuf to des describe your request response models, um, but then in add that converter both on the client layer and on the server layer uh, to use protocol buffers as your mean of communication, but also then let um, testers go and make natural JSON-based requests. Uh, we use that for our navigation system. Any other questions? Awesome. Oh, sorry the demo didn't work. Thanks, y'all, for coming. <laughs>